Well, good morning and welcome to Alexandria Covenant. We are so glad that you are here. We are looking forward to our time of worship together. And if you're joining us over in the patio or you're online, we want to acknowledge and welcome you as well. And if you happen to be a guest with us today, uh, we just want you to know on the back of the pew in front of you, there's a connect card that we would invite you to fill out, drop in the offering plate. Uh, If you're a guest with us online or over in the patio, we do have an online option on our website or our app, but it just gives us a chance to connect with you during the week and get to know you a little bit better. We have a good morning ahead of us. We have the privilege of worshiping the living God, both as individuals and together as the body of Christ. And as we get to gather and sing songs of praise and observe communion together, remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us, and listen to the teaching of God's word with receptive, open hearts, we are, through our worship together, collectively declaring the truth of the gospel message and that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And we get to declare both to God and to those around us that we will follow him with our lives. And in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So would you stand with us and let's worship our God together. I got 
where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Amen. You may have a seat. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to be with you this Lord's Day. For those of you online, I want to welcome you as well. I know you've already been greeted and you in the patio, but I just want to greet you and let you know I see you too. You know what? It is a Sunday where we gather as God's people to come to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a table of remembrance where we get to be invited to to remember the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in giving of his life and shedding of his blood so that through him we could find forgiveness of our sin. And that's exactly what we're going to do today as you're invited to come. Come to the sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify, not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of God's mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek God's presence and to pray for the Spirit. As we come to this table today, the Lord wants us to come with a a pure heart, 
a heart that is prepared to receive the elements of communion. And one of the things he asks us to do is to confess our sin to him so that we can come to the table with a pure heart. And I'm just going to throw out a challenge to you this morning that if you have not confessed your sin yet today, you're going to have an opportunity to do so. But if you have a grievance or a sin against a brother or sister in Christ here in this room, I don't want you to come to the table until you go to that person and you get right. And I know that this maybe seems hard, but it's really the invitation that God has asked of us to be right with others so we can be right with him. I offer this prayer on behalf of our church family as we confess together our sins before the Lord. Here's our prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen and amen. The promise of God's word is that if we confess our sins to Jesus Christ, he will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to share with you now the words of institution that the Lord Jesus delivered to the Apostle Paul. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, and for the invitation that we have to the table today. I pray that as we come to the table, we remember the significance of his sacrifice for our sin that in him and through him we can find life and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite the servers to come to the table. Uh, For the rest of us, we will start from the front and work our way back. When you're invited to come, you can stand, uh, exit row right, come up, receive communion, and then enter row left and have a seat, and uh, we'll continue our worship now. So you're invited to come.
body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the work that he accomplished on our behalf through the cross. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. As we transition from communion to other parts of our service today, I want to just uh, let you know that Kevin Jones, who happens to be our chair of our capital campaign committee, has uh, come to bring about an update for us uh, on the capital campaign, as well as uh, an invitation. And so, Kevin, thanks for being here. I appreciate you giving the update and the invitation. Um. Good morning, everybody. So my purpose up here is threefold. First, I want to update you on the status of our capital campaign. Second, I want to provide a brief explanation for those of you who aren't already aware of the campaign. And third, to make a gentle invitation, as Pastor Trinity suggested. So first of all, as you can see by the slide behind me, we are now to the point where we've raised uh, over $200,000 in cash donations to our capital campaign. And I want to start with a very big thank you to everybody for not only your generosity toward the campaign, but also your generosity toward the church ministry generally. I will say also, I want to thank the Lord for consistently and faithfully providing the resources to our church for all the ministries that he has put in front of us over the years. I know since I've been here and since 2014, it, it has been excellent. And uh, I know it was true well before that as well. So let me explain for those of you who aren't really up to speed on the capital campaign because we, we launched it you know, at our annual business meeting in, on June 25. Um, we basically launched it in order to first eliminate our mortgage debt from the uh, prior building project a number of years ago. And the debt at that time was a little over 1.1 million. And it's been reduced now down to near $700,000. And we have additional donations to apply to it. Um, in addition, we wanted to provide funding for some long-term uh, large capital projects that we knew would be coming up during this period of time. The first and the, and the biggest is the redoing the parking lot, which we estimate the cost to be about $750,000. The second is to reshingle the roof on the older part of our building, and that's an estimated cost of about $250,000. So we have um, paid additional amounts to our from our capital campaign donations to the debt. We continue to do that. Um, we maintain a cash balance um, that of $300,000 as a church in order for to be prepared for any contingencies that come up, but anything over that we apply. Our end goal is to free up more cash flow for certain ministries that we feel called to expand. The first is the rural ministry development. The second is to strengthen our mission partnerships. And the third is to expand our tech ministry. So, so far, we have pledges of nearly $200,000, which again, thank you, big thank you to those who have pledged. To those who have not yet pledged, I just wanna make uh, an invitation to prayerfully consider any amounts that you may feel led to pledge over the next, the rest of this campaign period. And I want to point you to an insert in your bulletins, which has a pledge form. It also has a Q&A about the uh, capital campaign and also suggested ways to give. So thank you very much for tolerating me up here. We'll go back. That ends the uh, commercial interruption of our service.
There's no interruption. But let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, as the scripture says, Psalm 24, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And everything includes us and what we own and our finances and all that stuff. And we just want to just pray that we would be good stewards of what we have. Uh, individually, as a church, we just want to be good stewards that we might see uh, the Word of God and, and people coming to know Christ. And we just want our mission to go well, locally as well as worldwide. Thank you that we can participate together. And as we do that, Lord, just bless each one as they give according to what you want them to give. So thanks for this time and that, and thanks for Kevin bringing the message. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. And if you don't notice your bulletin, there's a lot of information there, so be sure to read that during the week. Uh, as far as the offering, for those of you who are new here, we take an offering at the end of the service, just right outside the doors. And if you've never given online, if you're thinking about that, it's a way, good way to do it. Do it that way, it makes it easier sometimes, but that's up to you. And so what I want to do right now is, is have you do a greeting. Now, a couple weeks ago, I said you had to smile before you greeted. So you don't have to go intense on the smile, but just give a little smile, and then let's greet right now. All right. Well, before we go any further, um, I want to ask you to pray with me. Um, we had a young girl, one of our uh, young girls in the church, just have a medical uh, incident, and so we're going to pray for her as uh, the MT is on their way. Um, she is alert, um, but we're just going to ask the Lord to intervene. Father, we thank you that you care about our intimate details of our whole life. So we pray for Emmy, that Lord, you would protect her, you would heal her, that those who care for her will have great wisdom, discernment, and discretion to meet her needs. We ask you to bless her now and to watch over her. We pray for her family. We pray for the rest of us as we pray for her in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, um, now, to draw your attention back to the Word of God as we focus on uh, our series in the book of Ephesians. If you have your Bible with you, I'd invite you to open them to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, you can follow along on the screen behind me, or there is a Bible in the pew in front of you. If you would prefer, you can certainly follow along there. But it will be advantageous to have the text open and maybe in your lap as we journey through uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 together today. So here we go, uh, beginning in verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 through verse 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father, as we take but a moment to open your word today, Holy Spirit, we ask that you will fill our hearts and our mind with understanding. Encourage us that we may live a holy life before you. Understanding the salvation that has been granted to us 
by grace through faith in your son Jesus, in your name, amen. Well, all throughout the book of Ephesians, we are uh, moving towards a greater understanding, you could say, of what it means to be in Christ, a greater understanding of what it means to uh, take hold of our identity. For once we were dead, but now we are alive. Throughout the book of Ephesians, not only do we gain insight to our identity individually as Christians, but collectively as the family of God and who we are and what God has purposed for our lives. Today's passage is full of contrasts. And to be honest with you, uh, the, there, there's no greater contrast in the Christian life than that which to consider a life before Christ versus a life after Christ. The contrast here that is so stark in its reality is that we have gone from dead people to living people. We have moved from hell-bound to heaven-bound. We went from living for ourselves to living for the glory of God. Now, many people believe that this passage of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, is, is maybe the most important passage in all of the Bible for three reasons. One, it summarizes for us the human condition. Number two, it provides for us a glimpse or a summary of what the gospel is. And number three, it gives us a, an understanding of our future hope in Christ. And so we talk a lot about salvation and how it's by God's grace, and, and yet to understand the significance of God's grace in the salvation that we have, we have to begin to ask ourselves, so, so, so what's so amazing about God's grace anyway? I think today we're going to hopefully learn a, bit, a little bit more about what is so amazing about God's grace when it comes to our salvation. Now, in order for us to get around to understanding truly God's amazing grace, I think it's important that we begin by understanding who we really are and why we need God's grace in our life. And so today is a message that comes with both bad news and good news. And I want you to know that today's message is not an easy one to preach because it's kind of one of those hard messages that gets a little bit in your face and makes you consider certain things and, and causes us all to get a little bit uncomfortable. But then there's this pivotal moment in this message where we recognize the value of God's grace in our life and, and the bad news turns to good news because of who Jesus is. And so if you leave today wanting to crucify me, I want to remind you, I am just the messenger. <laughs> this is God's word to all of us. And I'm privileged to share it with you. Let's begin right out the get-go. Point number one, without Christ, we were spiritually dead. Remember, to understand God's amazing grace, we must understand who we were before Christ. Who we were before Christ was we were people who were spiritually dead. Here, Paul begins by saying, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Really what Paul's going to do here is he's going to take a spiritual x-ray of our lives and he's going to reveal to us the results of this spiritual x-ray. And I want to remind you it's a spiritual x-ray, not a physical x-ray. Because in the reality of this spiritual x-ray, we're going to find what the human condition is really like apart from Christ. We're going to discover that our heart is bent towards sin. We're going to realize that on our own, we would never pursue God, for salvation comes by grace through faith because of God's pursuit of us. When Paul says that we were dead 
in our trespasses and sins, he means dead. Spiritually speaking, we are all dead without Christ. So though we're physically alive, spiritually, apart from Christ, we all share that same reality before we're made alive in Christ, and that is that we're dead people walking. To understand that we are dead in our trespasses and sin is understanding that that trespasses is simply choosing to go our own way rather than God's way for our lives. That's what a trespass is, to go our own way rather than to go the direction that God wants us to go. We're dead in our sin simply means that that we are choosing to do what we want to do rather than what God wants us to do. And in terms of meeting God's standard for our life spiritually, apart from Christ, we will always miss the mark. We can never live up to God's standard of holiness on our own. And as a result of that, Paul begins this whole section by helping us understand that apart from Christ, we're dead. So there's two categories of people in this room today and online and in the world. There are those who are alive in Christ, and there are those who are dead apart from Christ. There's only two options when it comes to our spiritual condition and whether or not we're alive or dead. But one thing that we all share collectively together is we all started dead, but some of us have become alive. So what about the people who do good things and are yet spiritually dead? I mean, naturally, this is one of the questions that I begin to ask because so many people in the world, though they're spiritually dead, still do good things. And, and it's so confusing sometimes to Christians to consider how spiritually dead people can be good. Well, one of the things I'm going to suggest to you today is that the reason spiritually dead people can do good things is because they're motivated by selfish ambition. And their selfish ambition is is to prove themselves to be good people and to prove themselves to be good enough to be accepted by God. Apart from God, we can't be spiritually born. And apart from Christ, every human person's heart is bent towards themselves and selfishly and egotistically lives to fulfill their own desires. So are you saying, Pastor, that even those who are dead apart from Christ, who do good things and live morally upstanding life and are really kind and are really generous and are really all these things are motivated by selfishness? Yeah, I'm saying that because I think that's what God is saying. So let's not be surprised that people can be morally good. That's not a condition for salvation. The condition for salvation is that we need Christ to bring our dead self to life. And apart from Jesus, we can never be spiritually alive. For only God can bring life to death. In the book of, or the gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 15, a a very familiar story to many of us, especially who grew up in the church, I'd I'd encourage you to turn there, but this is really the the, the parable of of the lost son. And in Luke chapter 15, what we recognize is that this man had two sons and one stayed home and he lived a pretty good, upstanding, morally good life and he was trying to do and be all that his father wanted him to be. But then there was this younger son who was the rebel in life and he wanted his inheritance and he took his inheritance and he took off with it. And as a result of it, he squandered it and then he ended up working for a farmer who happened to be working with a pig farmer and he was a Jew and so 
pigs and Jews don't go together, and so this was another defilement of his life, and he ends up working with these pigs and eating their slop and coming to a realization that I don't belong here. He came to the end of his rope. He realized that he was poor in spirit. He began to mourn over his sin. He was humbled. He recognized his need for God's mercy. Are you hearing the Beatitudes in this? And as a result of it, he went home. He went home with a contrite heart. He was repentant, seeking forgiveness from his father. And I want you to listen to the end result of his homecoming. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and the shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. And why, we can ask, why celebrate the homecoming of the son? Listen, for my son was dead and is alive again. How awesome is that? From death to life. The contrast couldn't be any greater, and yet it's worth celebrating. It's a reality that none of us can accomplish on our own, for we need God to do it for us, and he's promised to do it through his son. Paul goes on to talk about how our condition is apart from Christ. And essentially, he said that we are dead people walking. To understand what what Paul means here, as he goes on to say, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedient, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh and carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. What Paul is recognizing here is that a dead person's life is a life that is consumed by that of the world. He points out three things. He says that apart from Christ, we followed the world. What does it mean to follow the world? Well, it means that we're allowing the world and its influence to take control of our life and direct our path. We're allowing the world's values become our values, and we're not seeking to live out God's values in this world. It means that we take on the attitudes, the habits, and the lifestyles of the culture around us. You know, that of the lifestyle of the rich and famous. At the end of the day, a dead person's walk is the way of the world. Now, for all of us who are Christians, we must pause here for a moment and reflect on this reality. Anybody who is not in Christ, who is not spiritually alive, is looking for spiritual life. And they want to know what it looks like. And what God wants us to do and how he wants us to live is to be and to live in such a way that those who are apart from Christ can see the value and the life that we are living in Christ and be drawn to that. For if we as Christians don't live any differently than that of the world, why on earth would they want the Jesus that has brought life to us? For they seemingly can accomplish and get all that they want without the Jesus we have. So we must be different. We must live different. The second thing that Paul said is that when we were spiritually dead, not only did we follow the way of the world, but we followed Satan himself. He says that apart from Christ, we are called sons of disobedience. The reality is there is a spiritual battle raging for our souls, for it's not a battle of flesh and blood. It's a battle of the powers and principalities of the spiritual world. We must recognize the reality that apart from Christ, you don't belong to God, you actually belong to Satan himself. And when we belong to Satan in Ephesians chapter 5, we'll get there, but Paul links what a life of disobedience actually looks like. He says it looks like a life of sexual immorality, impurity, greed, and foolish talk. This is what it means to belong to the world and to Satan. 
But there's a third thing that Paul addresses in a dead person's walk, and it's that we followed our sinful desires, that we sought out to please the flesh and our nature and our desires more than anything else. Once we lived, and this is how he says it, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Paul is making this contrast between those who are in Christ and those who are apart from Christ. But one thing he makes clear is we all started in the very same place. In Galatians, Paul talks about the types of, you could call lifestyle sins that captivate the people of the world. And he says they're sins like anger and sexual immorality and idolatry and sorcery and jealousy and strife and dissension and drunkenness. If we pursue a life in the flesh, we cannot pursue a life in the spirit because they're contrary to one another. Paul also says that in Galatians 5. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul says this, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And finally, Paul provides us with probably some of the hardest words we will read in all of the Bible when he says in verse 3, the end of it, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is the human condition apart from Christ. We are dead people walking who deserve God's judgment and God's wrath. This is what people call the doctrine of depravity. The reality that apart from the work of God in our life, We are so bad that we can not only not be good on our own, but we're so bad that we can never come to God on our own either. Now, that's all the bad news. And if you're uncomfortable with it, that's probably good news. But let me give you some really good news. And it begins in verse 4. And this is what Paul says, but God, I'm just going to sit there for a minute, but God, apart from God, you're a dead person walking. You're hopeless and condemned. You have nothing to look forward to in this life or the life to come, but God. How great is that? For in Christ, we are spiritually alive. This is Paul's second point in this whole passage, that in Christ, we move from death to life. And I'm not sure there's any more important words than these two words in all of the Bible, but God. When we were condemned and at the end and could do nothing, God came to rescue us through his son, Jesus Christ, and he made a way and he brought hope to our lives. And he did this because he loves us. And that is moving from the bad news to the really, really good news. Amen? Amen. So who is God and what did he do for us anyway? Let's consider the reality of this as we we consider what Paul now says. He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Who is God? God is a God of mercy. 
and love and grace and kindness. Who is God? God is a rescuer who loves humanity for we have all been created in the image and likeness of God. But because of our sin nature, we're left to his judgment and his wrath. But because of his love for us, he's made a way for us to not only experience life in this world, but to experience eternal life in him and through him. So what has God done for us in Christ? Well, Paul, he says really four things. He made us alive. He raised us up. He seated us with him in heaven. And he continues to pour out his grace on us forever and ever. Amen. And that's really cool because what that means is that his grace is not only poured out upon us here and now, but in all of eternity, Jesus' grace continues to be poured out upon us in a way that allows all of God's creation to celebrate the endless love of God's limitless grace that is being poured out upon all of his creation, a creation of humanity, which is different than all of his creation. And that grace continues to remain in our life for all of eternity. What Paul is simply saying here in chapter 2 is that what God did for Jesus in chapter one by raising him from the dead through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is able and willing and is doing in us who are alive in Christ. For when Christ was raised from the dead, he raised us from the dead too and he placed us in the heavenlies with Christ and he's given us everything we need to live the life that he has for us to live. All of this because by grace and through faith, we were willing to accept that gift of salvation that Jesus has to offer. I want you to consider with me John chapter 3 for a moment. We all know the Bible verse John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. But how about the context? We have a religious leader, Pharisee, teacher of the law, Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus at night asking questions about spiritual things. And Jesus says, well, well, wait a minute. Of your caliber and status as a religious person, you don't understand these things? Jesus began to talk to him about what it means to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, I don't understand. I don't get it. You mean I'm supposed to crawl back into my mom and come out again? And Jesus is like, no, you can't do that. For that which is born of the flesh must also be born of the spirit if you are to be born again. And the only way that we can be born again is when God takes the blinders off our eyes and gives us the spiritual insight to see the truth of the gospel. I want to remind you of how this ends because in John 13, or John 3, verses 16 through 21, we read these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is good news. Verse 18, for whoever believes in him is not condemned, But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because of their works that were evil. For everyone who does does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Here's my question. Are you born again? Have you been born again? Has God brought spiritual life to your dead body? 
For the only way that this can happen is through Jesus Christ. When by God's grace, he reveals the reality of the gospel to us, and we by faith accept the very thing that Jesus has done for us. For when we accept God's great gift of salvation, he makes us alive in Christ. Amen. The third thing that Paul goes on to express here is that in Christ, we are not only alive, but we are God's masterpiece. Beginning in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith in this, not of your own doing, for it is a gift of God, not as a result of the work, so that no one can boast. So what do we get right off the get-go? That salvation is a gift. And if we have any part in it, it nullifies the gospel and it voids the gift and it makes God out to be a liar. The grace of salvation is received when God opens our blind eyes to the gospel, enabling us to understand its claims and accept its promise of forgiveness for all who believe. In case you're wondering what the message of the gospel is, it's simply this that Jesus came to live the life we could not live because of our sin nature. He died the death we deserve to die because of our sin so that we could gain a righteousness or a right standing with God the Father that we could never gain on our own. That's the message of the gospel. And that's the reality of God's love for you and for me. Paul goes on to say that this gift is something that God gives to us by grace so that no one can boast about it. Now, we understand boasting as bragging, right? I mean, if we're going to boast, we're going to brag about something. But in ancient days, they would have understood this idea that Paul was trying to communicate that to boast was to put your confidence in someone or something. And so when you consider the fact that people would go to war, they would, put, they would boast in their king or they would boast in the king's army. And what Paul is saying is, put your confidence, put your boast, not in yourself and your abilities, but put your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust that what he did for you on the cross is enough to pay for your sin and to pay for my sin. Only God can bring life to dead people. The third thing, or the final thing within this little portion, it's this last verse, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Good works are important, and we can't lose sight of that, but we must put good works in its rightful place. One commentator said it this way, and I love this. Works are not the root of our salvation, but the fruit of our salvation. It makes sense, doesn't it? Not the root, but the fruit of our salvation. The reformers used to say it is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. Because our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ should produce a work in us that allows us to go out into this world and to do the good things that God prepared long before for us to do so that we don't get the glory or the credit for it, but that God does. This word masterpiece Poema, in the Greek, it's likely where we got the word poem from. And the way it's described is that an artist would either put to paper the the, the form of his artwork through song or poetry, but also artists who would sculpt things and make things. What Paul is saying is that when we become alive in Christ, it's then that God begins to sculpt us and shape us into a masterpiece. And that this masterpiece is to be on display for all the world to see. 
who God is and what he can do with spiritually dead people when he brings life to them. Do you realize that in Christ you are a masterpiece? That God is forming and shaping and then putting on display for the world because he's proud of you and he loves you and he wants others to see him in you and experience him through you. Which brings us back to the mission of God through the church. We aren't saved just so that we can go to heaven and be with Jesus someday, though that's true. We're saved to be on mission so that those who are spiritually dead people can come alive in Christ like we have so that Jesus can begin his work in their life of making them into a masterpiece too. So church, will you join me? I know so many of you are so faithfully on mission for Jesus, but will you join me to turn your life one degree to be more missionally focused, to be more intentional of allowing you as God's masterpiece to be known by others so that through you, others can know him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful today for your loving kindness and your grace. That God, you even have the ability to take a dead person walking and bring life to them is amazing. It really is amazing grace. Father, I pray that we will never lose sight as your children of the value and the worth that we are to you and the mission that you've called us to in making you known to others so that those who are dead can become alive in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we close in this song together. Got you.
You know, when we have Jesus, there's nothing more we could ever have that would be greater than that gift itself. And I trust that if you're here today and you don't have Jesus and you want him, that you will turn to him. And the promise of his word is that he will receive you by grace and through faith. Our prayer team will be up here and they would love to stand with you and pray with you if you made this decision today. But otherwise, may you go in the grace and the mercy and love and kindness of God. Let your light shine so bright that people will see your good deeds and bring glory to God in heaven. Have a great day. We'll see you next time. 